Scattered across the west coast of Florida lie the remnants of the largest maritime empire that the world has ever known. Before the advent of the common metal boat anchor, weights made from stone were the status quo. Anchors of this sort are consistently found precisely where we would expect to find evidence of ancient seafaring civilizations, such as the Mediterranean Sea, Indian Ocean, etc. The average weight of an ancient stone anchor is between 30 and 300 pounds, with the size typically that of a backpack or tombstone. This is because these stones must be small enough for men of ordinary stature to deploy while floating in water. However, ancient stone anchors found in Florida average at least 10 times larger than those found elsewhere in the world. The Saxer stones of southwest Florida are a collection of ancient limestone anchors which can today be found serving as residential lawn ornaments and landscaping features. Not only are these stones excessively large, but they are located where we should not expect to find evidence of an ancient maritime empire, in the eyes of mainstream academia, that is. While my Saxer Stones and Saxer Saga presentations focus on the discovery, history, and mythology of these megaliths, this video will show precisely how rocks of this sort and size were realistically utilized by ships of titanic caliber. In doing so, we will also establish a link between the Saxer Stones of Florida and the infamous Drogue Stones of Ararat. For those who do not know, Precisely where Noah's Ark is said to have come to a rest in the mountains of Ararat, we find what were previously considered the largest ancient stone anchors in the world. That is until the discovery of the Saxer stones. The beliefs expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect my own. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida, baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Believe it or not, the word anchor is one of the oldest words known to man. This English word can be traced back to the Greek, ankura. However, if we follow this phonetic thread back in time even further, we arrive at Enki, the Sumerian god of water. Anchor from Enki. This is the same root from which we get the dense metal ingot. The Egyptian ankh itself is a type of anchor, as it differs from the Christian cross only in that it can be fastened by its loop at the top, much like an anchor. The Finnish, Basque, and Irish languages are unique for being unrelated to the Indo-European or Aryan language family. Despite this, the Finnish word for anchor is anguri, the Basque word is angira, and the Irish word is anker. To further demonstrate the universality of this phonetic thread, we find on the other side of the earth the Indian word for anchor, langar, 
or rather, la, anchor. The phonetic root, ang, as in England or Anglo, but also do, ing, living, etc., can be traced back to the ingvas rune of Northern Europe. This rune symbolizes the Germanic god of male fertility, Ingvi Freyr. Also known as the seed, this glyph can be interpreted as showing a double helix DNA strand, or a rotated Masonic square and compass. It is no coincidence that both of these symbols imply a connection to ancient fertility rites. In Finnish and Phoenician mythology, Ingvi Freyr is simply known as Baal or Baal. At risk of being lewd, a man's balls contain all his genetic material and are the only part of the body which is suspended from above like an anchor. The words ancient and ancestor also share this phonetic thread. Considering the context of this video, anchors belonging to ancient ark ships which seeded mankind, we should remember it was an ark angel that may have actually sparked the Virgin Mary's pregnancy. The boat-shaped male appendage is the part of the body most known for producing angles. It is from this part of the body that a man gets his ink, houses his ancestors, receives his answers, his anger, angst, encouragement, inklings, hankerings, younglings, etc. If one receives an encore, one comes again, finishes, or regenerates. An oncologist is one who treats cancer, or rather, ka answer, that which reproduces unc uncontrollably. Knowing that we get the word father, or pater, from Jupiter, the word uncle must come from enki, known to English speakers as the Roman Neptune, brother of Jupiter. To drive this point home, we should notice how one's ancestry is referred to as lineage, or blood line, meaning tied to a line, or anchored to the past. Ancestor with a C, I mind you. Captain Jose Maria positions the ship. Tensions run high. Good to go. But what do we look for? Ships? Wood rots over thousands of years, but breakwaters, jetties, and stone anchors don't. Are these docks? Maybe they're breakwaters. And then... Finally... A huge ancient stone anchor. Even Ralph, the ever-skeptical marine archaeologist, is excited. It's about this big. It's uh, 83 centimeters across. And it's uh, about this thick. It's smooth on both sides. It's got a nice hole in it. And uh, yeah, we were quite, quite surprised to see that. After weeks of fruitless searching, Everyone's excited when Ralph determines that the anchor could date to the Bronze Age. It fits the Atlantis timeline. These are still, these are still, yeah. It's really an amazing find. I mean, a lot of people will get excited about anchors, but this anchor you should get very excited about. This is a 3,000, 4,000 year old anchor that 
is massive for a very, very large boat that shows us that ancient large boats were sailing into this area 4,000 years ago. It's widely believed that mankind did not sail into the Atlantic Ocean before the 8th century BC. According to this idea, all fishing and trading routes in this area were confined to the Mediterranean Sea. This anchor tells a different story. Flora's Anchor is the name I have given to the first stone that Saxer recognized as an ancient stone anchor. All of this anchor's mass rests at the larger, bottom portion, which allowed for a perfectly defined rope groove to form where the anchor would be tethered from above. This is the Saxer Stone, which most undeniably displays its use as an actual anchor. The fact that this stone was at one time fastened by a rope cannot be disputed. This anchor takes the name Flora for the street which it is on, but just happens to be the patron goddess of Florida. Over yeah, yeah, okay, please. My name is Mark. Yes. I've been living here about 12 years now. This used to be uh, in laws of relatives' house of mine. And the only thing I know about this rock is the woman that lived next door was here when the cul-de-sac was built. She told me that the original people that owned the house bought the rock for $500. Mm -hmm. She thought they were goofy, and that's about all I know, from, uh -huh. except from what you guys are telling. Uh -huh. Okay. The Sand Dollar is a unique anchor named for its disc-like shape, which features two identically shaped holes bored parallel to each other. This anchor features two holes for the same reason that average-sized stone anchors do. It allows two men to tug on the anchor with two separate ropes from either side of the boat in the case that the anchor is stuck or lodged at the bottom. But you can see they're basically 17 and a half inch round holes. And uh, the only difference we have here is this edge has been maybe protected by the larger size here. But the last anchor we looked at had it all rounded and smooth. So uh, to me, it lets me know that that anchor was in the water a lot longer. This And uh, Dr. Longo pointed out that somebody pressure washed this, so they pressure washed the uh, age right off of the uh, rock by washing that orange.
The Silver Spur is the tallest standing anchor that we are aware of. It is about 10 feet tall and extends a couple feet down where it is cemented into the ground. This stone is named for the street it is on, but it seems the street was actually named for this jagged, spur-shaped landmark. This anchor also features a second hole, but the top portion has been broken off at some point in time. This is a magnificent example of an ancient stone anchor. We stand next to it. You can, um, you can see we've got a perfectly round, probably 17 and a half inch hole here, and we do have a 17 and a half inch hole up here. And you can see where this is broken off. So the last one we were at had two holes. This is much like that last one, only it's tipped sideways, and because of the pointy side, it makes it look uh, a little different character. But you got to remember, there's a wave coming in at 500 miles an hour, and it's twisting these things on a ship, and so sometimes they break off. And so if I were to go 10 degrees north of uh, east from the coast, I might find the other piece of this rock because it would have been dropped off, and the one thing that isn't moving in a tidal wave is rocks that are laying flat on the bottom of the, of the ground. So. Uh, I was asked about this hole. It's kind of got a bowl shape in here. And um, if it were on a lathe, I could explain uh, that method, but I can't figure out, you know, I don't know everything. I can't figure out why they had a bowl shape in there. But it could have been done long after Atlantis and somebody was using this as a way of uh, uh, washing some kind of food product. While an endless amount of theories have been presented as to the location of the city of Atlantis, little to no archaeological research has ever been directed towards locating the fleet of Atlantis. This is why the Saxer Stones of Florida trump all other notions of a rediscovered Atlantis, be they American or Eurasian. While the assertion that a civilized, let alone seafaring people, once inhabited the southern United States, does fly in the face of mainstream academia. The Saxer Stones of Florida serve as undeniable evidence of this reality. For the record, mainstream academia does not deny that ancient stone anchors were in fact used in Florida. They actually display limestone and coral anchors in the exhibits of their own museums. They simply only present the anchors which belonged to vessels of no remarkable size and neglect those which demand uncomfortable questions like the Saxer stones. John Saxer did find a single ally in the form of an accredited archaeologist and anthropologist, William Donato. Positive that he had located the true Atlantis in the Bahamas, Donato centered much of his career diving and researching Paradise Point and the Bimini Road, just off the coast of South Florida long before Graham Hancock would popularize these sites. Oh, this is one of the anchors on the Bimini Road. Apparently this one is closer to a Minoan anchor, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Laura saw this while we were looking at that toilet-like, seat-like thing. Okay. Uh, this is interesting to me because it shows the three stones falling over that are underneath this big one here, which are apparently supporting some which rectangular. This is a Lucayan anchor from 1380 AD. You see all the holes here that were connected on the inside, okay. Uh, this is on lands in on the Little Bahama Bank, and this is, was a perfect circular hole about six inches, and it's broken here. I think you see more in the next one. Yeah, right here. You can see this is an absolutely perfect hole. Okay. 
Uh, this is the big anchor, the one that looks like a Carthaginian one. There's the hole right there. This weighed about 400 pounds, and it was quite interesting. We're pulling it up, and Esley says, oh, let's make a good anchor as a boat's going like this. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. This is at um, Anguilla Cay. You see these nice, very close patterns along here. Okay. This is also at Anguilla Cay. It looks a lot like Bimini. Also at Anguilla Cay. Right here, see the very tight. Uh, these, these are less disturbed. The Bimini Road was apparently in the 20s and 30s. People were taking stones off it to build up the jetties in Florida, and I don't blame them. They didn't, couldn't have known what it was. Okay. Uh, these will be um, some from Tampa. It turns out a uh, man, John Saxer, had these very interesting stones, which looked like our anchors, but they were far bigger. Looked like our anchors, but they were far bigger. Did you take Bill Donato here? Yes. What did he think about this one? Well, Bill Donato uh, was an archaeologist and an underwater archaeologist out in Buena Vista, California, I believe. And he was working with the Edgar Casey Foundation, and I brought him in to show him my stone anchors all around Florida. So we went and did a little tour just like we're doing here today. And he said that the, these were the biggest stones he's ever seen. He said that on camera, with, uh, we got Channel 8 as a camera crew tagging along with us. Uh, this is in Florida. This is big enough to put a volleyball through. It's very interesting. Um, it resembled the anchors, but uh, it may have been for some other reasons, okay? Back now, this is the, the unusual one. This was six feet high, 12 feet long, and it was going into the ground. They even have a place called Indian Rock Road. These are spread out all over, and there's not a single source of stone that I could find. These are, there are various rope groups that go around these circles. I think one's about 17 and one's about 15 inches. And you can see some of the lines here from the rope grooves that have been about two inches thick. So they asked me if it was an anchor, what it'd be for. I says, oh, I don't know, something like a destroyer. Something like a destroyer, because it's a pretty good size uh, piece of rock. There are quite a few of them, and they're different uh, types of stone. This one we couldn't date because there was no organic material in it. Okay. Uh, this one was really interesting. Uh, you see the two holes here in this very definite groove thing. And I would figured if this was a pier, there'd have to be anchors. And on the south side where the current flows, we found a lot of anchors. This is a very big one. OK, those are some of the anchors. And I have those if anybody wants to look at them. You see the rope grooves right here. Something was Yeah, that's okay. it. Um, Bill, thank you so much. So it's like these stone anchors. I'll tell them, well, this is definitely an anchor. And they'll go, no, it's got to be a mooring stone. Well, they haven't put in 53 years of research. And uh, they didn't have sails on these big, old, ancient arcs. They had uh, these anchors, and they're drogue called stones. Dro drogue stones, and they dro dragged along the bottom of the water so that they could turn the ship in different kinds of weather. They would uh, have the stones drag on one side of the ship in order to point it in another direction. So they had a different way of sailing. They were using the side of a huge oil tanker-sized boat that would accommodate 30 or 40 giants. Now, these stones, or this type, anchor stone, is a very familiar object to the students of early uh, navigation. They were used by uh, many of the early civilizations, uh, the Phoenicians in particular, and the shores of the Mediterranean and the uh, floor of the Mediterranean is strewn with these stones. The difference that becomes obvious immediately is the difference in size. These giant pierced stones are similar to ancient anchor stones used in the Mediterranean for centuries and millennia. These pierced stones are like the large Bronze Age stone anchors from the Mediterranean. Tall, broad when viewed from the side. The following video will help demonstrate that the Saxer stones of Florida were indeed actively deployed as anchors, not mooring stones as many people who are simply in disbelief of their sheer size will foolishly assume. These stones may have been used as static mooring stones by subsequent races of smaller stature, but I can assure you they were in fact deployed by ships of titanic scale. The only true debate to be had is whether these stones are simply weighted anchors or highly sophisticated Phoenician-style drogue stones used to create drag for stabilizing and even steering large ships without a mast, as in the case of Noah's Ark.
These bits of footage come to us from a National Geographic documentary about Noah's Ark. You can view the full clip right here on the Anchor Stones YouTube channel. In this demonstration, an exact scale replica of Noah's Ark is placed into a scientifically monitored wave pool. The model arc is then loaded with weights, representing Noah's animal cargo. For the first round of experimentation, the arc is subjected to simulated storm conditions in the form of sizable waves. For this initial experiment, no drogue stones are used. The model arc, true to Noah's design, does not fare well. Unable to maintain a favorable direction, the boat quickly rotates to the most vulnerable position, allowing waves to collide with it side on. The instrumentation monitoring the arc measured a peak roll angle of over 50 degrees, which would likely have killed everything inside. When repeated with the model's watertight covering removed, the arc sank very quickly. This is precisely the problem that ancient drogue stones were designed to solve. These suspended weights will correct direction and prevent ships from taking the full impact of dangerous waves. Types of drogues are used extensively to this day for the exact same purposes. The experiment is then repeated with the addition of Phoenician-style drogue stones. We know for a fact that the Phoenicians and other ancient cultures deployed drogue stones with ships powered by ore and mast, but this test is to see whether these drogues can protect a powerless, drifting ship of titanic proportion. As mentioned earlier, drogue stones of this exact sort are found strewn across the mountains of Ararat precisely where Noah's Ark is said to have landed. The wave pool is turned up to a threatening level, and large swells begin to travel towards the model Ark. Because of the drogue stones, the Ark is prevented from rocking, and, amazingly, withstands every wave that is sent its way. According to the Anchor Stones YouTube channel, this second clip of the experiment, with the drogue stones, although filmed, was not included in the final National Geographic production. Why do you think National Geographic would include the footage of the Ark suffering and sinking, but not the footage of the Ark being protected through the use of drogue stones? The Bible says the Ark will be 300 cubits long. Now, a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm 6'1", my cubit is 21 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit was 18 inches. The standard Egyptian cubit is 20.6. That boat-shaped object is 20.6 inches times 300, or 515 feet long. So that doesn't prove it's Noah's Ark, but it could be. It's in the right place, it's about the right shape, and it's about the right length. It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic. Makes it about almost two football fields long. Pretty good-sized boat. In that region, they found 12 big rocks that weigh about 9,000 pounds apiece. These rocks have holes in the top. Apparently, that hole was to hold a rope, and this rock was held over the side of the boat. 10 or 12, or who knows how many. They found 12, could have been more. That's called a drogue stone. If you hang a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat becomes more stable during stormy weather. It's like a whole bunch of shock absorbers to keep the boats flat, you know, keep your platform flat. If it really gets windy, They'll drag behind you, and it turns the boat perpendicular to the waves. Now you can't roll over, capsize. That's real dangerous in high seas. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hoven, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having rocks hanging all over the side. He said, you are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back and said, where was he going? He's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to float. Brother. And I'm stupid, yeah.
I debated a former preacher turned atheist. And he said, you can't build a boat more than 300 feet long because it'll break going over the waves. He said, they built a ship one time that had six masts, you know, a six master. And the, you know, the tw it twisted the boat so bad it leaked all the time. They finally had to give it up. Noah's Ark didn't have any masts. Hello, it's designed to float, not to sail. All right, <laughs> probably a big barge of some kind. I don't know. He said, a boat, you know, when the waves come up, it bends and breaks in the middle. Well, a lot of boats over 300 feet long have been built out of wood and survived. The Chinese had some really big ones many years ago, out of wood. Plus, if you put a moon pool in the boat, that solves the problem. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls up on the inside, of course, so the boat doesn't sink. And as, the, as you go over the waves, this relieves the stress. Now the water com actually comes up inside the boat partway. A moon pool is a pretty cool idea. As the water goes up and down in that hole, it would be relieving the stress. Good, great place to dump your garbage too, by the way, inside the boat, out of the rain. Thirdly, it acts like a giant piston to pump fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. Uh, remember what he had in the basement? You might pray for a good wave once in a while. <laughs> yeah. A collection of megalithic drogue stones scattered across the mountains of Ararat, precisely where the biblical ark is said to have landed after the flood, serves as the most concrete proof to date of a historical Noah's Ark. Amateur archaeologist Ron Wyatt is the man credited with bringing the drog stones of Ararat and other biblical landmarks in the area to the attention of the Western world. This is our first anchor stone. Measuring 11 feet in height, with 4 feet embedded in the ground, it is actually the largest and most beautiful anchor stone found to date. A tapered hole was drilled into the top of each anchor stone, a 5-inch opening on one side and a 7-inch opening on the other, allowing a rope to be pulled through and a knot tied. It was designed to be lifted while in the water when it would weigh less, thereby preventing the top from breaking off. The most striking feature is the crosses that have been carved on the anchor stone. Early Christians came through this area and recognized these objects as biblical items from the ark. They carved crosses on these anchor stones, representing Noah and his family. The largest cross here represents Noah and is of the Crusader style. The diamond shape with a cross above was Nimrod's sign when he was alive. The diamond represents the ark that he took credit for. Then the vertical line is the pathway to heaven, with the crossbar representing heaven. The Egyptians had an adaptation of this symbol called the Ankh. Smaller anchor stones or drogue stones can be found near the Mediterranean. This is one of the largest you will ever see outside the Noah's Ark area. The next anchor stone is partially buried in the ground with five crosses. The largest cross represents Noah. The next smallest, Mrs. Noah. Then the three smallest are the sons of Noah. At the bottom is a possible image of the Tower of Babel which was built around 200 years after the flood by Nimrod and his rebellious followers. This particular stone has seven crosses, with the eighth having been removed at some point in time. This stone has a large cross representing Noah. The next smaller cross on the bottom left is Mrs. Noah. The next three smaller crosses represent the three sons, then, the three smallest represent the wives of the sons. This stone does not have any carvings on it, but it does have a hole drilled through the top. Other stones have been found buried, but they have no inscriptions. This stone had a hole drilled in the left side. Then on the right, we can see ancient inscriptions. Vandals have broken this stone, but you can see where the hole once was in the top. Crosses have also been carved on this stone. Five crosses are on this anchor stone. And as we look at the top, we can see where the hole has been broken off. Outside the village of Kazan is a large object that has the appearance of petrified tree bark and with unusual characteristics. 
far as we know, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Nobody's ever. My goodness. It's got crosses uh, that crosses? are very faintly carved on it. There's you got a big, there. you got a big one here. You got a small one right there. One here. One here. They're they're harder to see. And this is petrified wood. Well, it looks like Ron it, it? said he thought it was petrified bark. tree bark. Right. If you look at the, you ever seen? It looks like a little bit like pine bark. It sounds like metal. Yeah, <laughs> with the anchor stone being wood. Would this isn't an metal? anchor stone. Oh, oh, I see. This is, this was just like something that uh, was only art, right? Well, Ron <clears throat> theorized that this might have been the or part of the cover. You remember? At one point, it says and. Uh, Noah came out of the ark and he took the cover off, or he yeah. threw the cover off. He, and of course, that's just speculation. We don't have a way of knowing, but this is a rather unique thing. It has the appearance and the texture of some kind of a bark, but you know, it is stone. That is a gross. That, that is a gross. <coughs> there you go. That is incredible. It has a very hollow sound. Very hollow. It sounds yeah, like metal. But it's just a well it's uh it's just that's just harmonic right. Yeah. yeah. Harmonic resonance, you're right, yeah. But I'm okay, we'll not, not many stones that do that. Let's try it. <coughs> With the sun coming out. There's well, I think there's eight crosses on it. We've been able to find seven. I think there's an eighth one up there. Now we're going to come to some evidence that I believe is really strong in supporting this area as the site of Noah's Ark. In this area have been found around 30 drogue and anchor stones. As mentioned earlier, these drogue and anchor stones were used as ship stabilizers to better withstand storms and cause drag so ships weren't driven and tossed on the oceans. Found in this area are around 30 of these drogue and anchor stones. They are found scattered along a path running from west to east. It appears as the waters were receding from the great flood, the drogue stones began hitting the land under the water and then they were cut loose. The remaining stones are generally in the area where the ark eventually came to rest. Many of these stones have holes carved in them for connecting ropes from the ark to the stones. Some of the holes have broken over the years in some of the stones. So on the tops of these stones, they had holes in them and the ropes would go through those holes and then they were attached to the ark. These drogue stones were continually used in ancient times after the flood and can be found in places like Israel and the Nile River in Egypt. So these drogue stones were something commonly used in ancient ship staling, and they were used as ballast, they were used as stabilizers to keep the ship stable and to keep it headed into the waves so that it wasn't tossed to and fro on the oceans. These drogue stones are over 200 miles from the closest ocean and about 5,300 feet or 1,615 meters above sea level. They have no business being here other than that a huge ship like the Ark dropped them here. So they're a long ways from any water and they have no business to be here other than that a large ship dropped them here. The numerous stones discovered near the Drupanar site are the largest ever discovered in the world are the largest ever discovered in the world. This would make sense as the ark was massive in size and would need extra large stones to stabilize it. Many of these stones have crosses carved on them from early Christians visiting this site, and others have crosses that are from the Crusader period from around 1200 AD. Some of the stones have eight crosses on them, representing Noah and his family that were saved from the flood. 
Several of the stones have been used as grave markers as well. One of these stones has an ancient carving that appears to be the Tower of Babel. The three layers carved on this stone are believed to represent the three levels or decks of the ark as mentioned in the Bible. Another stone has unknown ancient writings on it that have yet to be interpreted and translated. All these carvings reveal that this site was venerated long ago and visited by religious people for thousands of years. Another large stone is believed to have been used as a sounding stone for measuring the depth of the water under the ark. We also come to the names of the places that affirm that this area is where Noah's Ark came to rest. We have a place called the Village of the Eight. This village was named after Noah and his family that God saved from the flood. Then we have Cargo Conmaz. This means the crow or bird won't land. This refers to Noah letting the birds out of the ark to see if there was dry land. Then we have Ziyaret, Dagi. This means to make a voluntary pilgrimage. This likely refers to the pilgrimage of Noah and his family above the ark. Then we have Uzengeli town. This was formerly called Maser, which means to be drawn out of the water or judgment day. The name Moses has the same root. Then we have a place called Nasser. This means to make a sacrifice. This likely refers to the sacrifices Noah made to God in worship after he and his family were saved from the flood. Then we have a place called Yigi Tatagi, which means hero's anchorage. This likely refers to the place where the drogue and anchor stones came to rest in this area of the mountains of Ararat. Then we have a place called Arsa. This means to capture the earth. In the Semitic version of Arsap, which is Ertsap, means to cling to the earth. These names are linked to the place where the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The name for this town today is Sagliksuyu, and is where some drogue stones, the ruins of Noah's house, and Noah's altar are believed to be located. We also have a place called Nuhun Jamisi. This name means Noah's Ark in Turkish. It is referred to as the location of Noah's Ark today, and road signs placed by the government use it to mark the route to Noah's Ark National Park. Due to the history and evidence at the Drupanar site, the Turkish government designated this place as Noah's Ark National Park in 1987. This gives more weight to this site as the location of Noah's Ark. So interestingly, because the Turkish government has designated this site as Noah's Ark, taking into account all of the evidence, this just gives more weight that this site is very likely the true place of Noah's Ark. Now also, interestingly, what is believed to be the remains of Noah's home the grave of Noah's wife, gravestone markers, a stream by Noah's home that would have provided water for planting crops, vineyards, and animal husbandry, and a large rock that many believe was the altar Noah used for sacrificing animals to God has been discovered in the town of Arsap. The remains of Noah's home are believed to be located here in this area. It was once somewhat erected, but has been torn down over the years by treasure hunters. And uh, a stone this big would have had to been handled by a few giants that were about 24 feet tall in order to set this in the ship and move it up and down. Or they could have had uh, mastodons that were harnessed inside the ship and have...
That's the way it looks to me. Everybody else can form their own opinion. While the reality of giant skeletons has been covered at length in my Children of the Dawn video, we must touch on this subject as it relates to the Noah's Ark story. Ron Wyatt is said to have discovered a sarcophagus in the mountains of Ararat, containing a skeleton who stood over 15 feet tall. There is in fact a consensus among most theologians that mankind not only lived upwards of 300, 500, and sometimes 900 years, but that they also grew to extraordinary height. While this may sound far-fetched, this specific skeleton was examined by dozens of researchers and in no way is a hoax. A sarcophagus was discovered by Ron Wyatt in this area as well. Now a sarcophagus is a stone coffin or container, and it was used to hold the skeletal remains of a person who was about 15 feet or 4.5 meters tall. So in this area were the skeletal remains of a person, and it's believed these remains were those of Noah's wife. It's believed before the flood that the people and animals were much bigger as they lived longer. The sarcophagus has been hauled off by treasure hunters and sold on the black market. However, its depression in the ground is still visible today. It's also believed the jewelry that Noah's wife was once wearing was robbed and sold on the black market for millions of dollars. Some of the skeletal remains have survived and reveal the size of the person who was in the grave. Two tombstones were found in front of what is believed to be Noah's home. On one of the tombstones found by Ron Wyatt, it had carvings of eight people, a rainbow and a dove on it. This tombstone is believed to be that of Noah's wife as the second largest person is looking down with her eyes closed. This aspect of the Noah's Ark story cannot be overlooked as the only other place in the world where giant skeletons and giant stone anchors are found in abundance is Florida. Newspaper articles from the state between 1850 and 1950, many with photographic proof, display the presence of extraordinarily sized skeletons in the Florida Peninsula as archaeological certainty. As put forward by John Saxer in his research, only men of extraordinary stature could have manipulated anchors of this magnitude. It's also believed the jewelry that Noah's wife was once wearing was robbed and sold on the black market for millions of dollars. Some of the skeletal remains have survived and reveal the size of the person who was in the grave. Two tombstones were found in front of what is believed to be Noah's home. On one of the tombstones found by Ron Wyatt, it had carvings of eight people, a rainbow and a dove on it. This tombstone is believed to be that of Noah's wife as the second largest person is looking down with her eyes closed. Remains of ancient corrals have been discovered where it's possible Noah kept his animals are nearby along with a stream, pastures, and so forth that could have been used by Noah and his family. Also, you can see a large rock here that's believed to be the altar where Noah possibly offered sacrifices after the flood. There have been found in the area around the site many sea life fossils and an abundance of sea coral that give evidence that this area was once underwater for a significant period of time. This would match the Genesis account of the great flood as found in the Bible. Broken remains of an ancient steel, which is a stone or wooden slab erected in the ancient world as a monument, were claimed to have been found on top of a ridge near the Iranian border by Ron Wyatt. 
the broken pieces were quite large and most were exposed, which allowed Ron to photograph them for later piecing together. This steel contained numerous inscriptions of what looked like three different forms of writing. One segment was noticeably legible. This was a scene depicting the unique ridge just above the site, a mountain peak in the background and a ship with eight faces on it, and two ravens, one flying above the ship and one above the mountain. The rest of the inscription featured several animals, but the importance of the steel was that the shape of the boat was almost identical to the 1950s aerial photo of the boat-shaped object. The eight faces within the boat needed little explanation according to Wyatt, but most importantly, the steel was just beyond the site where Ron had found the 120 by 40 foot section he believed to be a portion of the bottom of the ship. He would study the inscription more later, but at that time it appeared to him that it was marking the location of the original landfall of the Ark. Also an ostracon was found by Dr. Bill Shea around 100 feet or 30 meters from the boat formation. An ostracon is a teaching tool used made up of a piece of broken pottery that has something written or sketched on it that passes along an important story. On one side of the ostracon, as interpreted by Bill Shea, it has an inked on drawing of a man with two birds. One is on his arm and the other is being released. Below it is a bird flying back that has a branch in its mouth. The other side shows a man with a mustache and beard and has a hammer and spike in his hands. Shea interprets this as Noah likely building the ark. Now Dr. Robert Mickelson discovered an ossuary in 1998 above the Drupanar site that dates back to around 1600 BC, 900 years after the Great Flood. This would have been the time Noah's descendants inhabited the area. An ossuary is an item the deceased person's bones are put in and kept for long-term purposes. This was done only for very important people. There are also ancient relics one would expect to find at a site that has been venerated for thousands of years. And you can see here some interesting relics and shapes of objects that just attest that this area has been venerated for many, many years. Now let's look at some historical accounts or eyewitnesses of people who believe they have seen the Ark over its history. The Gilgamesh epic gives Mount Nisser as the landing place of the Ark. The local name for the town today is Uzingali. Also, the town just above the boat-shaped object was formerly called Nasser. This is similar to Nisser that the Babylonian writer Berossus described as being near the Ark site in the 3rd century BC. Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian living around the time of Christ, wrote, Its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day. This means the Ark was not on top of Mount Ararat as it's covered in ice virtually year-round. Theophilus of Antioch in around 115 to 185 AD said the ark could be seen in his day in the Arabian mountains. Later, church fathers also mentioned the ark as late as the 7th century AD. Ptolemy's Geographia in 1548 mentions the mountains of Armenia as the place of the landing of Noah's ark. So does the traveler Nicholas de Nicolae in 1558. It was also reported that pilgrims over the years visiting the site would gather its bits and pieces of the petrified wood which would be used as charms to ward off evil. When they encountered the drogue and anchor stones, they had no doubt as their association with the ark. For those who have not put two and two together, the word drogue stone has the same root as drag meaning to produce drag in water, or to drag behind. However, this is also the same root for the word drug. Drugs are that which drag us down, are they not?
There was me, that is Alex, and my three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie, and Dim. While sex also has the ability to drag us down towards degeneration, we may now decode these concepts together in another one of the oldest root words known to man, dragon. Seeing as how we have covered the dragonesque aquatic serpent deity Enki, we can here mention the Sumerian god Kur or Kor, believed to be the oldest recorded depiction of a dragon in human history. When we combine the words Enki and Kur, we of course are left with the word anchor. Drogue stones aside, anchors do drag beneath a boat. The word dragon has two possible etymological origins. The first is the Greek drakon, meaning serpent or giant sea fish. With this understanding, Enki, Neptune, Poseidon are all technically dragons. While in the West we associate dragons with wings and fire breath, most dragon symbolism on the earth today is of an aquatic nature. The Chinese word for dragon is lung, long, or lung. Notice the ung sound, implying a connection to enki or ingvi. The Chinese long is nearly identical to the Hindi word for anchor, langar, as mentioned earlier. Anchors need a long rope, do they not? Other words bearing this ing or unk sound are yank, sink, sank, tank, and so on, all indicating submersion into water. The other possible origin of the word dragon is the Proto-Indo-European or Aryan root of durakin, meaning to see, or one with a deadly glance. This is the same root as reconnaissance, reckoning, reconcile. The phrase reiki also pulls from this phonetic thread. To see could also be interpreted as the sea, and we again arrive at more anchor symbolism. Back to degeneracy. Astrologically speaking, the archetypal dragon deity and the god of the sea, Neptune, Enki, etc., is also the wandering star which rules over illusion, intoxicating drugs, and tantric gnosis. Neptunian imagery in a mythological or religious context, including all dragons, serpents, snakes, etc., is used to symbolize these alternative pathways to God. A war between serpent and eagle symbolism is signified on the crests and flags of many nations across the earth and can be traced back right to the Mesopotamian, Enki, and Enlil. The story of Enlil and Enki represents the clash of the differing Jupiterian and Neptunian attitudes towards spirituality. Cultures which venerate Neptune in the form of the sea serpent, snake, wingless dragon, and so on, tend to place a positive emphasis on the use of psychedelic drugs and tantric sex, often the focus of ancient ceremonial fertility rites. In hopes of attaining direct communication with God, their ancestors, the unconscious mind, etc. Cultures which venerate Jupiter in the form of the eagle, a phoenix, a mounted knight, often trampling on a serpent, Thor's hammer, the Christian cross, and so on, tend to place a positive emphasis on military conquest and phallic imagery, but look down upon the usage of psychedelic drugs 
and sex acts which they publicly deem sinful. Forgive the generalizations, as there is much more to be said on this topic, but that will have to suffice for now. The clash between Jupiterianism and Neptunianism is also illustrated in the legend of St. Patrick chasing the serpents out of Ireland. According to the fossil record, no serpentine land animal has ever inhabited Ireland. The word Patrick actually comes from the latter half of the word Jupiter. This is also the origin of words like Peter, Potter, Paternal, Patrician, etc. Patrick the Jupiterian symbolizes the Christian church taking hold in the island, who then goes on to kick the Neptunian pagans back into the ocean. The Hidden Anchor gets its name from the fact that when John Saxer first showed us it, it was completely covered by vegetation. When we return to the area, months later, after the release of the Saxer Stones documentary, we found the whole stone trimmed bare and standing proudly. We knew it was an especially large stone before this, but we were now confronted with the fact that it may be the largest stone anchor ever discovered makes you wonder why somebody would be okay with leaving it hidden. As a matter of fact, the sand dollar, silver spur, and hidden anchor are all likely upwards of 10,000 pounds and are all candidates for the largest stone anchor ever discovered. you can have something like this this big is if you have uh, something like us a larger human maybe up to 24 or 5 feet maybe as large as Atlas was 30 feet tall and you'd be lifting it up kind of like a bowling ball Celtic. Now, now this one's on the beach. This is an absolutely dead, perfect hole in this one. Like almost like a pipe had gone through it. I have no idea what the thing was for. Okay, maybe astronomical sighting. Maybe astronomical sighting. These, if you're wondering, are apparently anchors. You see the holes in the things. Okay. The anchor known as the fridge was not featured in the Saxer or Stones documentary, as it had slipped John's memory at the time. It takes its name from its rectangular shape. On the topic of never-before-seen anchors, 
I would like to share some of the sacks or stones submitted to me by viewers. I thank you all for sending them my way, and I ask that you please continue to do so. One noteworthy Saxer stone submitted to me actually stands in front of a massive decommissioned boat anchor as if somebody is trying to tell us something. Another subscriber was in Puerto Rico and sent me pictures of extremely well-crafted Saxer stones being used as makeshift fencing. I can't get a good picture of this one because my son is right behind me, but this hole goes straight through to the other side and it's obviously been drilled and it's right below the initial hole in the stone anchor here. Anyway, so this one has two in it, but that one goes straight through to the bottom to the other side.
A video sent to me by a Floridian actually shows an entire wall crafted from saxer stones, mortar, and aggregate. When discussing a historical Atlantis, we must keep in mind that sea levels rose considerably following the end of the recent ice age, roughly 11,000 years ago. This coincides almost perfectly with Plato's date of 9000 BC for the fall of Atlantis. When considering the exceptionally low and flat Florida peninsula, this shift in sea level alone may account for the legend of a sinking landmass west of Eurasia. Additionally, by most accounts, Atlantis is said to have been destroyed completely, with little to no trace. I hope this satisfies those expecting marble, Greco-Roman ruins to be waiting in the ocean for the right people to find them. Atlantis, like all advanced civilizations, would have been a product of its own age, not that of another. Despite the aforementioned excuses, Florida is indeed the graveyard of an expansive phantom civilization who terraformed its landscape 
to an extent not yet fully realized. When the first archaeological explorations of South Florida were underway around the turn of the 20th century, anthropologist Frank Hamilton Cushing recorded man-made canals large enough for oil tankers, pyramidal platform mounds, thousands of submerged terraces, sophisticated fish corrals, mortuary temple complexes, astrologically aligned earthworks, and many, many other features of a highly developed society. All that was missing was the original architects. Cushing was actually in complete awe of the abandoned shell-based cityscapes before him, albeit covered in light brush or mangroves. He would walk away with the realization that a great but unidentified civilization once inhabited southwest Florida. He used phrases like Venice of the West to describe the sophistication of Florida's man-made waterways. Cushing would die young within years of his expedition to southwest Florida. However, numerous subsequent excavations have affirmed these findings as well as hundreds of newspaper articles of the period. Not to mention the fact that the entirety of Florida is traced by an intelligently designed inland canal known as the Intracoastal Waterway, formed by a one-of-a-kind continuous strip of Barrier Island. All of this consistent with historic descriptions of the once great Atlantis. The legend of Atlantis has passed from generation to generation for hundreds of years, capturing our imagination with its claim of an advanced civilization that disappeared under the sea. The search for remnants of the lost empire has taken researchers around the globe. They claim to have evidence showing Atlantis submerged off the coast of Bermuda, in the Mediterranean Sea, near the Canary Islands, and as far away as Antarctica. Now there is another theory that the remnants of Atlantis are not submerged at all, but lie in plain sight on the American continent in what is now Florida. Let's take a closer look at Plato's description of the land to see why this piece of Florida real estate is worth exploring as the origin of Atlantis. Solon said that the whole country was very lofty and precipitous on the side of the sea, but the country immediately about and surrounding the city was a level plain itself surrounded by a mountain range which descended toward the sea. The plain was smooth and even and of an oblong shape. It extended in one direction 330 miles, but across the center inland it was 110 miles. This part of the continent looked toward the south and was sheltered from the north. The plain was fashioned by nature and by the labors of many generations of kings through long ages. There was a large ditch that followed its coastline. The depth and width and length of this ditch were incredible and gave the impression that a work of such extent in addition to so many others could never have been artificial. The ditch was excavated to a depth of 100 feet and its width was 600 feet everywhere. 
It went around the whole plain and was 1,100 miles long. It received the streams that came down the mountains and went around the plain, meeting at the city, where its waters ran off into the sea. Further inland, straight canals 100 feet wide were cut from the ditch through the plain, letting the water off into the sea. These canals were at intervals of 11 miles. They transported the fruits of the earth in ships by traversing passages from one canal into another and to the city. Now you know the true meanings of Atlantis. The Atlantis Kingdom was once the boundless continent known as North, South, and Central America. Atlantis Continent refers to either North America or South America as one of the Atlantis continents. Atlantis Country describes the area of land including Florida, Georgia, the Appalachian Mountains and the Great Lakes. It was the royal country that ruled over the other nine countries. Atlantis City refers to the royal city of Atlantis and is now Tampa, Florida. Atlantis Island refers to the small triangular island now known as Harbor Island near Tampa and it was once the home of the royal palace. Plato wrote of Atlantis in past tense because he thought it had sunk. The truth is, Atlantis is still very much above water today with all of its geographic features in place, tangible and measurable, just as Plato described. The work of John Jensen has shown significant prehistoric terraforming, spanning west central Florida, where the Saxer stones are most concentrated, all the way to Key West, all of which are underwater, indicating great antiquity. All cover-up and Smithsonian sabotage aside, we must also understand that the Florida Peninsula was hastily developed under the assumption that the landmass had little to no archaeological significance. It was only after Florida became blanketed with golf courses, country clubs, and shopping malls that the greatest of this state's archaeological jewels came to light. In the 1970s, Sonny Cockrell discovered the oldest intentional burial in the Americas at 11,000 years old, inside of Warm Mineral Springs, Florida. The Windover Bog Site and Manasota Key Offshore Site both yielded 8,000 plus year old human burials. In the case of the Windover Bog Site, these actually contained European DNA. The 444 Brickle Site in downtown Miami, dated to 7,000 years ago, in itself demands a rewrite of the peopling of the Americas. This site's sister site, the Miami Circle, only a stone's throw away displays a degree of astrological knowledge and precision that does not at all fit the flint-napping hunter-gatherers we are shown in Hollywood propaganda. If we extend the term Atlantis to include the entire Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, we find no shortage of impressive ruins dating to a time not at all understood by mainstream academia. 
The following comes to us from Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious Universe. Quote, Only 30 minutes by air from Miami Beach in Florida, Bimini calls itself the gateway to the Bahamas. For tourists, the place is paradise. But for seekers of lost worlds, Bimini may be the site of the most alluring lost civilization of all. Bill Donato believes that beneath these waves is evidence which could prove that Atlantis lay here. The civilization said to have flourished 10,000 years ago until sea rose around it and swamped the place forever. In 1926, the American medium, Edgar Cayce, predicted that the true site of Atlantis would emerge at Bimini in the Bahamas. Casey sent a follower to look for signs under the sea. If we pause here, I would like to remind the viewer that Bimini was actually one of the original names of the Florida Peninsula, not just the small island in the Bahamas. This is shown to be true in my True Fountain of Youth presentation. Quote, in Bimini, he employed a local fisherman, Pastor Bonefish Sam, who gave him all the help he could, but at first without success. One day Sam suggested they should look in a place he had known about since childhood. They went to the spot. The following are the words of Bonefish Sam himself, describing the discovery. The full clip comes to us from Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. Quote, And he jumped overboard, and when he put his head down like that, and he raised it up, and then he jumped out of the water and said, We found it. We found it. Here it is. Here it is. We found it. End quote. The waters off a tiny Caribbean island called Bimini cover a long stone structure that scientists have yet to explain. The stones appear to be so carefully placed, some people have concluded they are either a road or a wall, perhaps even a remnant of Atlantis. A nearby healing well is supposedly linked to the mystical springs of that lost civilization. While diving near Bimini, a San Diego physician claims discovery of a submerged pyramid, inside which he found a crystal ball. He says this crystal emits a power capable of repelling metal. Is it possible that the Bimini wall, the well, and the crystal ball share a common past with the legendary continent of Atlantis? The twin islands of Bimini, 60 miles east of Florida, are a tropical paradise, home for 2,000 people. The atmosphere is relaxed and happy. It seems difficult to imagine that these easygoing people could be the descendants of Atlanteans who purportedly had the power to rule the world. There is, however, evidence that alludes to that fact. Beyond the fashionable yachting docks in the dense undergrowth of the North Island is the figure of a fish etched in sand. Native lore gives no clue to what it represents. But it does lie close to a mysterious series of huge square rocks submerged in 15 feet of water off the coast. The blocks are so perfectly fitted together that some people have likened them to a Roman highway. No clues exist to the origin of the blocks. There are claims that they are ordinary beach rock which broke off from the Bimini coastline thousands of years ago. Such formations are common in tropical waters throughout the world. One of those who believes the wall is beach rock is Eugene Shin, a U.S. Geological Survey team member who conducted an analysis of the Bimini Wall. We did uh, two types of things. First, we cored the blocks, and we determined that they were beach rock. And every geologist, and that's dozens of geologists, have looked at those rocks, and everyone has come to the conclusion it's beach rock because it's so easy to recognize. The uh, question is, are those slabs of beach rock in place. Shin and a three-man diving team used hydraulic drills to bore through the rocks. 
18 cores were taken. The goal was to determine if the stones had once been part of the coastline. If so, had they fallen into the sea or been carefully placed in position? After drilling down half a foot, the geologist removed the cores and examined them closely. The pattern of the grain indicated that the stones had formed naturally and then at some later date became submerged. This finding led to Shin's own conclusions about the origin of the wall. Oh, I think that it's an entirely uh, natural phenomenon, uh, composed of beach rock, as I pointed out earlier, and a combination of a little rise in sea level and the scouring out of the sand underneath has caused the blocks to uh, settle to the bottom. And all of the various shapes can easily be explained by well-known natural phenomenon familiar to, to all geologists. Shin points to a similar phenomenon occurring at the Dry Tortugas National Park south of Key West, Florida. Could the constant attack of the surf have created the lines in the Bimini Wall just as it has created these individual blocks in the Tortugas? Other questions remain unanswered. How could the Bimini Wall have dropped 15 feet when the natural erosion rates indicate that it should be no deeper than three feet below the surface? More importantly, how could part of the wall run perpendicular to Bimini's coastline? We are left to ponder the possibility that the Bimini stones were so carefully cut and aligned, they are in harmony with existing natural beach rock. This painstaking placement would require sophisticated mechanical tools. Such tools could only be designed and handled by people of superior intelligence. In the 1930s, psychic Edgar Cayce predicted that part of Atlantis would surface in the late 1960s. In 1968, the Bimini Wall was discovered. Was it possible that the strange stone structure could be part of Atlantis or one of its outposts? Plato was the first to mention Atlantis. While chronicling aspects of the Atlantean people, he claimed that they controlled energy-charged crystals as well as healing wells possessing great curative powers. Healing wells do exist, according to Les Hemingway, author, explorer, and brother of Ernest Hemingway. He had heard of just such a well on Bimini. He and his daughter Hillary agreed to guide us to the site. A narrow inlet, approximately 300 yards long, leads into a mangrove swamp. The brackish water is populated by tiny sharks and rays. Some, like Hemingway, speculate that both plant and animal life thrive extremely well in the area as a result of some peculiar qualities possessed by the well water. Admittedly, Hemingway is not an expert on the well's special properties as a result of direct personal experience. However, he has concluded that the well itself apparently possesses the power to heal. Here is where the actual fountain of youth is. The flow is thousands of gallons per day, and it's absolutely cold, pure, fresh water coming right up in a saltwater pool. The water apparently has definite curative powers because various people who have both major and minor ailments have soaked in it and have experienced an amazing amount of ease from their problems. People who have gout, for instance, have found that the gout disappears in two or three soaking. Other people with small skin cancers and people who have skin inflammations have found that the inflammations and the small growths on their skins have literally disappeared as a result of poultices and soaking with water from this fountain. Surprisingly, Hemingway's claims have received some scientific support. Miami psychologist Adolfo Villasuso tested the well waters and found an unusual amount of a certain element. There were two water samples that I had analyzed in two local laboratories. Uh, one of them I took myself because I was kind of surprised at the uh, high amount of lithium that was found in the well. It was a substantial amount. Laboratory analyses repeatedly revealed that the well water did have an extremely high content of lithium. Researchers within the last 10 years have found that lithium has been particularly useful in producing soothing reactions in both normal and disturbed people. 
originally, before it was known that lithium exerted a calming, a therapeutic effect in people with manic depressive illnesses, there are stories in Roman times, in the Middle Ages, that uh, people with this illness were sent to wells which were high in lithium and lo and behold, they were cured. Did an ancient race know of Bimini's lithium well? If so, perhaps Plato's assertion that Atlantis possessed magical waters was correct. The way this well has been cut down through solid rock and the way this well seems to be so well hidden are two very different things. The hiding part, I think, may have developed in the last few hundred years and is a result of just local growth. But the cutting down through solid rock is something that had to be done by intelligent beings who had access to great use of tools and most unusual tools. We don't know whether Atlanteans did this or not. I, of course, would like to think that they did. And it's very possible that they did. It's just that none of us were, have been able to trace back prehistory to Atlantean days in this particular spot. From the air, another peculiar fact about Bimini becomes apparent. Perfectly straight lines carved in the sand slice across the island. Most point directly to the well. Perhaps the lines, the Bimini wall, and the well are linked by common ties to the people of Atlantis. Is it possible that further exploration around Bimini might reveal hard evidence of the brilliant but lost Atlantean civilization? The secrets of a bygone civilization are often not easily revealed. The discovery of structures built by the early Egyptians sometimes leave us more puzzled than satisfied. Great debates rage over how an ancient people accomplished such architecturally complicated buildings. And no one explanation satisfies the question, why were the pyramids built? Equally intriguing are similar structures found throughout Central America. Could the construction of these pyramids be linked with those in Egypt? The many stone walls that survive today reveal a high level of workmanship. The complicated stonework produced by both cultures still bemuses modern science. The stones off Bimini bear remarkable resemblance to those in Egypt and Central America. Is it possible that Bimini somehow linked the two together? In 1972, Miami disc jockey Roby Young and well-known psychic Irene Hughes launched a unique experiment here recreated for In Search Of. They hired a plane to fly over the waters surrounding Bimini. The purpose of the flight was to gain psychic impressions of the area to help uncover tangible evidence of the existence of an ancient civilization. We'll just sort of fly around, and if you get a feeling, it'll confirm. Now below us, you can see, is just crystal clear water. Uh, the drop off of the Gulf Stream, 3,000 feet down, from then on east, what do you think? Well, I feel that it is all the way along, like a tunnel, you know, but I feel that we have to make this turn, and as we turn, we're going to see, on the right-hand side, we're going to see some blocks. And on the left-hand side, we're going to begin to see gold color in different spots in the water. And I feel it's right over this way, and we're going to have to go that way and curve right back around that way. The plane crisscrossed the skies for more than two hours. Finally, Irene directed the search to an area where she felt something was buried on the ocean floor. It's a building, and I feel that it is pure marble, the most beautiful marble in the world, similar to that, some of that that was used in the building of the pyramids in Egypt. I feel that it is inhabited by the voices and the images of ancient people. The spot selected by Irene became the subject of an extensive search. For two years, divers combed the sea looking for evidence of an ancient civilization. They found the usual array of tropical fish and brilliantly colored coral, but nothing else. Finally, at the foot of a steep cliff, a diver spotted a deeply encrusted object on the ocean floor. What he had found was the base of a marble column. After a series of unsuccessful attempts, divers finally brought to the surface a number of marble slabs, each weighing nearly a ton. 
the slabs had apparently been part of a much larger structure. Whether they were in the process of being transported and went down in a shipwreck, or had been constructed in an area that was later submerged, is unknown. The Bimini Atlantis connection might have languished had it not been for Raymond Brown, a San Diego physician and adventurer. He believes he has found conclusive links between a Caribbean civilization and those of Egypt and Central America. Dr. Brown's story begins uneventfully on an expedition out of Miami in 1970. Here, recreated, Dr. Brown was headed for an area between Andros Island and the Berry Islands, approximately 100 miles from Bimini. His intention was not to prove or disprove stories about Atlantis, but rather to search for sunken treasure. We'd been searching the area for a number of years for Spanish galleons and had found several and taken some of the uh, treasure and we were very excited when we found this area. They traveled to a spot near the tongue of the ocean. There, the bottom drops to 14,000 feet. Dr. Brown hoped that a recent storm might have shifted bottom sand in order to reveal the galleons. The water was very murky and uh, we didn't get to see all that we would like to have seen, but after the storm uh, moved the sand for us that we'd been digging on for several years unsuccessfully, we found ruins and uh, buildings everywhere. Much of Dr. Brown's photographic equipment was destroyed in the storm, thus making it impossible for a detailed record of the find. We really had no choice because if we had gone back for uh, new equipment that we lost during the storm, if we hadn't got in the water even as murky as it was, we, the sand would have covered the buildings up and we would have lost the view. The ruins of the city Dr. Brown claims he found reflected a sophisticated level of architectural design. The buildings had somewhat of an Egyptian or classic look to them. Uh, the ground mass was rippled as though the area had been dropped into the ocean by some sort of cataclysmic action. Then, Dr. Brown reported that he came across the most magnificent find of all. In the murkiness, he spotted the tip of a submerged pyramid, barely visible above the ocean floor. Looking at the structure, shape, and the size, it would be approximately 400 feet tall. Uh, I went in an opening and in this opening, in the center of the room, there was a pedestal. And on the pedestal were two human hands made of brass or bronze. And in the center of the hands was the crystal. My first uh, impression in the, in the room was the uh, shaft that was metallic, hanging straight down from the ceiling, pointing at the crystal. And it was gold color. I swam because it was still the room was full of water. I swam up to the ceiling and tried to pry the uh, rod loose. It wouldn't budge, so I settled back down to the floor. And I reached my hand in between the fingers of the uh, metal hands, and I found the crystal was loose. And it was the only thing in the room that I could take home. The crystal bulb seems to possess powers that can repel a coiled stainless steel rod. We found a meter with a one and a half ounce weight and it becomes sensitive to emanations, uh, particularly magnetic emanations around people or things if they are charged. And we find that if we can hold it straight without uh, allowing it to flip from side to side, some strong influences will actually raise the weight in the air. Now, as we bring something into the field of the crystal, the ions tend to repel if I can keep it balanced and bring it directly into the field and not let it tip from side to side, the weight will then not go to the side if I can keep it centered. And it will, as I come higher, it will raise it and make it weightless and actually float in the air. Some historians say that crystals were the source of Atlantean power. Dr. Brown believes his crystal is evidence that such a culture existed and possessed powers unknown to modern man. Maybe the ancients knew more than we did about uh, life forms and life forces. 
and we might discover their secret. In the last decade of exploration in the waters off Bimini, new finds cause us to question old theories. Atlantis has long been thought of as a myth, a figment of fanciful imagination, a tale told by Plato to amuse ancient Athens. But what of Dr. Brown's crystal? Dr. Marcel Vogel, a researcher at IBM, has devoted more than 20 years of investigation to determine the power of crystals and their effect on human potential. Throughout history, the earliest recorded history we have, there's been a deep respect for the shape of a ball and the use of a quartz crystal ball for probing in the mind of an individual. Now, I've worked with Dr. Brown's crystal ball. I used his ball, and I felt a tremendous energy burst coming from the crystal. The discovery of the crystal has spawned speculation that possible misuse of its powers by Atlanteans caused the great cataclysm. The island and all its buildings, it is said, were plunged into the sea. The Bimini Wall, therefore, might be the last visible relic of that lost civilization. Divers have always searched for hidden treasures of the sea. In the waters off Bimini may lie the clues that not only unlock the mystery of Atlantis, but the secrets of the mind as well. For the present, however, we must content ourselves with the inconclusive bits of evidence so far uncovered. The origin of the Bimini Wall seems destined to remain an enigma until more knowledge about Atlantis is revealed. That's on Proctor's Road, so is this right here, and you see some kind of unusual marking. Is there okay? Um, this is one of the uh, leveling stones right here. It actually is kind of triangular shaped uh, right up here. Actually, half of a leveling stone because Greg broke the sample. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting shape, but basically you can see the, um, the shape of it. It is wedge shaped, and that's exactly what it is. The, uh, oh, okay. uh, you see again these nice uh, rectangular cut stones and very nicely covered. This particular stone is pretty average, and it's a rhombus shape. It's one that I can actually carry. Oh, most of these things are really small. This is from 1990. Um, I think that, oh, this is the Paradise Point here, the new stuff, I think, so let's keep going. You'll notice things like this. Yeah, okay, see, this is the new site. There's absolutely no doubt this stuff is artifact artifactual. You can see some of the patterns here. In the newer pictures, uh, uh, you can see whole um, areas, again, right here, right angled features. That's it? Oh. You can see some of the uh, things here and this terrible ocean creature that's... <laughs> uh, this, is the, this is really weird. Uh, when we had been, been there that day, it was related to a dream. It turns out that Col uh, uh, Andrew Collins, yeah, uh, who had written the book Gateway to Atlantis was there. I, I'd met him. He was on our Expedition 98. Really good observer. He had a dream uh, that he was like underwater and saw a tree. Well, on this particular day, when I verified my dream, there was this tree that was underwater <laughs> on the same feature. It was like two particular dreams that were the same area. And these are the stones, of course. That one had to be there. And of course, you see again the patterns of stones, even more obvious than some of the Bimini Road ones. OK. Uh, real nice right here. I think we're almost done. There we go. And this one, we actually cleared this. Juliet and I cleared this sand. You can see that this is, uh, what you find is things that are actually under the sand are very well protected. Uh, the organisms eat right into the rock. You can tell them that one right there, if you look at it. Uh, some that were at the end of one of the features on the road, I dug and it was like perfectly clean. You know, it was almost like a, a Mayan white sock bay. But anyway, this is uh, one, one of the more interesting ones, okay. Uh, oh, this one is blurry because the picture is blurry. <laughs> uh, I heard people saying that there was an arch that was north of Bimini. There is, there is not really an arch, it's what's called an architrave. Uh, in a Greek column, you have the columns, and the thing that goes right on top of supports the roofs is an architrave. It was an architrave. It is not ancient. Uh, some people were trying to claim it was. It is marble. I have a sample of it. It's about 11 miles north of Bimini. And um, there had been columns. Uh, what Krista had told me was that there were things that looked like tombstones. 
And I thought, this looks like something that would have been from like a funeral place or a mortuary place. And that's probably what it was from. It wasn't anywhere near ancient, but while we're going down, I see these two big shark tails out from under these like things like this. And I keep going like this and nobody's paying any attention to me whatsoever. Then Krista goes around and really starts yanking on the tail of this one to get it moving. She says, well, I thought you wanted to take a picture later on. And I think, no, it's okay. It turned out they were nurse sharks, which are not dangerous. You can do a lot with them. But one of them was like eight feet long, you know, kind of this weird gray uh, green color. But this, this one, did, it didn't come out, but I just wanted to have it. It was the only picture I have of that particular feature. Okay. Um, probably the Bimini Road. There's a place called Moselle Shoals, which is probably in the other ones, which has huge blocks of granite that are unbelievably big. Okay. Um, Bimini Road, these are some of those rectangular slabs. Bill, we're coming up on 11 o'clock. We are. So, uh, we're supposed to be out. Okay, those are some of the anchors, and I have those if anybody wants to look at them. You see the rope grooves right here. Something we're seeing. Yeah, that's okay. it. Um, Bill, thank you so much. Donato dove on these sites himself many times and was one of the first people to definitively declare them man made structures. Graham Hancock would prove this once and for all by showing extensive LIDAR scans of the area indicating expansive megalithic earthworks. The crew of the AquaQuest, an exploration vessel with the Edgar Cayce Foundation, discovered the tip of an actual step pyramid poking out of the sand near Bimini in the early 2000s, among other strange structures. These clips can be found in my Saxer Stones documentary. As we were freeing an anchor, one of the divers saw a pyramid-shaped object on the bottom. As I'm swimming up to the anchor, an object caught my attention over to my right side. The uh, base of this was about uh, six feet square, and this had various steps going up. So this could be called something like a step-shaped pyramid. Immediately, my heart was in my throat, and I thought, oh my God. I hope this portion has satisfied the question of where are the cities to go along with the anchors? We must here note that both the Saxer Stones of Florida and the Drogue Stones of Ararat are believed to have been venerated by the people who subsequently encountered them. This is displayed by the glyphs left on them. A prototypical male and female face, in the case of one particular Saxer Stone, and a plethora of Templar crosses in the case of the Ararat drogue stones. Um, oh, they also have these carved faces there. Uh, this is one of them. This, the, I think the next two slides are the same thing. Probably from the Mound Builder period. There's a lot of communication. They just had things that looked Almec and uh, Mayan. See right there and right there. Okay. Close it. John Saxer has asserted that the faces displayed on this megalith indicate Adam and Eve, the Greek Atlas and his lover Hesperus, or some prehistoric equivalent of the two. Interestingly, Saxer's Adam and Eve stone has another trick up its sleeve. This megalith is believed to have held ceremonial significance to aboriginal Floridians. Traces of blood are said to have been detected in its patina, indicating that the stone may have been the site of animal or human sacrifice. Excerpts of a 2002 article from the Tampa Bay Times can be found both on a plaque above the stone and on the website of the restaurant where the stone rests today. They read as follows. Limestone carving dates to days of the Temucua. Limestone rock showing Native American glyphs. The large limestone blends in the landscaping of the popular seafood restaurant along busy US-19. Most who come to Johnny Leverock's seafood house now known as the Widow Fletcher, pass by without noticing the crude faces carved into the rock. This eight by four foot rock dates back more than 1,500 years to when Aboriginal people occupied these lands. This rock is thought to have been carved by Temucuans between 1 and 400 AD. According to Joe Fulgham, general manager of Leverox, 
Folgum discovered some information about the rock in the files when he first came to the restaurant two years ago. A cavity indicates the rock was used for religious ceremonies at which food and other precious items were placed as offerings. Most likely, the carvings on the rock were the handiwork of the Tamukuans, one of the groups of natives at the time of Florida's discovery by Europeans and the beginning of recorded history. The greater Tampa Bay area was within the jurisdiction of the Tamukuans in the subdivision of Tocobago. Tocobago was the name of a Tamukuan village or chief or both located at Tampa Bay. It was possibly the largest village with the most important chief in a cluster of villages. The Tocobago Tamukuans lived a more sedentary life than their predecessors, building semi-permanent structures in small villages with a midden paralleling the shore. A midden is a pile of shellfish refuse that forms a mound. The rock was discovered in 1981, during construction of the Sea Market restaurant. A miniature golf course had been located there before that. The restaurant was sold to the Leverox chain in 1991. It has been left untouched since that day, not cleaned or otherwise altered. It was originally thought the rock was in its original location. However, a local resident said they remember how a boating channel was dredged and rocks were lifted out with a crane and piled on the adjacent land. The theory is now that the large rock was excavated during the dredging of the channel, but most likely the carvings on the rock were the handiwork of the Tamukuans. So what is the real history? We will probably never know, but one thing is for sure. The theories and myths continue to grow. From its infamous curse to a sacrificial stone, to a priceless artifact. What's your theory? It may make you famous. End quote. Although the article mentions that the stone was dredged up in the 1980s or earlier, it hastily attributes the glyphs to the Tokobago or Tamukua, a tribe that was present at the time of European arrival. Seeing as how this stone was underwater, and it is too heavy for primitive people to have lifted, it was likely underwater since the time when the sea covered that spot at least 7,000 years ago. This would mean that the 1 to 400 AD timeline is nothing but a bad guess, and the people responsible for these glyphs preceded the Tamukua by thousands of years. The Tamukua connection mustn't be discounted, however, as this tribe was said to not only stand over 8 feet tall at the time of European arrival, but were also observed to live for over 300 years. Both of these factors ought to be especially considered when discussing stories from the Old Testament. John D. Rockefeller actually constructed his Indian Mound Cottage on top of what is believed to have been a Tamukua sacrificial altar. Tim Bentz, a Christian theologian, speaker, and honorary Cherokee chief, postulates that the Tamukua may have been descendants of the original Canaanites. This would be substantiated not only by his experience with ancient Canaanite artifacts, but also the fact that tribes of these regions were found to speak forms of Paleo-Greek and Paleo-Hebrew, which all ultimately lead back to Phoenician. This rabbit hole is discussed at length in my Greek equals Creek video. Phoenician is largely synonymous with Canaanite. The Phoenicians are also said to be the people responsible for popularizing the use of drogue stones with large vessels. Something else that the southeastern United States and Phoenicians had in common was an abundance of inks. 
inks, or dyes, derived from local indigo and shellfish. This is evidenced by the Seminole tribe of Florida's liberal use of what were at that time considered the most royal colors in the world. For those who do not know, the Phoenicians are said to have largely built their empire through the control of the dye trade. We will now close with the Song of Seven Cities by Rudyard Kipling. I was lord of cities very sumptuously builded. Seven roaring cities paid me tribute from afar. Ivory their outposts were, the guard rooms of them gilded, and garrisoned with Amazons invincible in war. All the world went softly when it walked before my cities. Neither king nor army vexed my people at their toil. Never horse nor chariot irked or overbore my cities. Never mob nor ruler questioned whence they drew their spoil. Banded, mailed, and arrogant from sunrise unto sunset, singing while they sacked it, they possessed the land at large. Yet when men would rob them, they resisted. They made onset and pierced the smoke of battle with a thousand saber charge. So they warred and trafficked only yesterday, my cities. Today there is no mark or mound of where my city stood, for the river rose at midnight and washed away my cities. They are evened with Atlantis and the towns before the flood. Rain on rain, gorged channels raised the water levels round them. Feshet backed on Feshet swelled and swept their world from sight, till the emboldened floods linked arms and flashing forward drowned them, drowned my seven cities and their peoples in one night. Low among the alders lie in their direlect foundations, the beams wherein they trusted and the plinths whereupon they built. My rulers and their treasure and their unborn populations dead, destroyed, aborted, and defiled with mud and silt. The daughters of the palace whom they cherished in my cities, my silvered tongue princesses and the promise of their May, their bridegrooms of the June tide, all have perished in my cities with the harsh envenomed virgins that can neither love nor play. I was lord of cities, I will build anew my cities, seven set on rocks above the wrath of any flood, nor will I rest from search till I have filled anew my cities with people undefeated of the dark and during blood. To the sound of trumpets shall their seed restore my cities, wealthy and well-weaponed, that once more may I behold all the world go softly when it walks before my cities, and the horses and the chariots fleeing from them as of old. Yo, the lizard came right up to my camera. <laughs>